So good morning, everyone. Um, excited to see so many great faces in the room. My name is Michael Flores, and over the next half hour, give or take a few seconds, we're going to be talking about DevOps and AI. A little bit about me, why I think I have something that's worth sharing about this topic. So I'm a DevOps, AI, and robotics enthusiast. I work with robots. Not so much super hardware focused, but definitely a software type of person. I'm also an architect at IBM at our federal chief technology office. So I get to do all kinds of cool emerging tech stuff for the federal government, figuring out how to get it to work, how to make it compliant, and then you know, helping drive real, real solutions into, into government, which I think is awesome. I'm also a big open standards advocate, and I get to work with great groups like the Open Group, where I chair one of the forums called Open Platform 3.0, where we actually look at emerging technologies like AI, mobile, social, DevOps, and figure out what are the kinds of open standards to create around that to enable developers, to enable you know, entities to, to take advantage of these technologies openly. And I love dancing, big Latin dancer. That's me and my wife there at one of the local venues. Uh, I'm a gamer, like a lot of games, big PC guy, definitely a League of Legends nut, and I'm a dog person. Most of this is relevant because you'll see some of these things again, but not all of them. So if, if nothing of this talk resonates with you, but some of those things you feel ab strongly about, feel free to come to me and say hi. Happy to chat. So about this talk, I'll level set very quickly. This is not a deep dive into AI. Um, for anyone looking for that, happy to point you to things, happy to chat about it. But this talk, the focus is, helping understand what's the relationship between AI and AI projects and some of the DevOps practices that this community knows so well. My hope is to share enough about AI as a paradigm shift that the group here can start to understand how do we relate this to other paradigm shifts that we know more, familiar, more familiarly. And with that knowledge, what are the kind of problems that current AI projects face and where can DevOps fit in to help us succeed? And from that, I'll share lessons learned in a case study that I'm actually engaged in right now, working with an AI system. So let's start with a timeline. There are many AI timelines. They're all good. Wikipedia, I think, has the most comprehensive. Now, I picked this one because it gives us some good touch points about what were the, the cool, memorable AI-powered experiences, whether it's robots, whether it's applications, things that were big in the public eye. And this helps us understand how far we've come with AI and where AI is today. So early on, we start with the 50s. In the 50s, we had Alan Turing with the Turing test. This was before the term AI had really become an official thing, but there already talks about machines that could reason like humans. And the discussion became, well, how do we validate that? How do, we, how, do we, how do we describe a system like that? How do we determine if a system is sufficiently intelligent? And that's where the Turing test came out. And it was, the whole premise is, the Turing test is, says, if a human cannot distinguish an AI system from a human being in an interaction, then that system is said to be sufficiently intelligent. So this typically was a chat exercise where you're typing through a terminal, and on the other side, you have an AI and you have a human. And the whole purpose is, if the whole test is, if you don't know who you're talking to, that AI is sufficiently intelligent. Now, at the time in the 50s, this was mind-blowing. Wow, we'll never get there. You know, systems came up, took the test, none passed. But jump forward to 2014, we have a chatbot that did pass. Now, anyone who's big into AI and some of these cultures will, will know there's criticism about that particular chatbot and did it really pass? Was it engineered to pass? Regardless of how you take that, where, where you stand on that school of thought, it passed nonetheless. So that's a sense of where we've come from. Another big example that I like to paint to is in 1966, Shaky. I like to uh, think of Shaky as the, the prehistoric Roomba. Because the purpose of Shaky was just to get from uh, point A to point B through a room, bunch of obstacles. And Shaky, if you, if you look him up, you can find videos of his brave journeys. He had all the instrumentation of a Roomba to figure out, how do I get there? But poor Shaky, right, back then, took a very long time to make decisions. So if you look up this video, put it up for a, for a good laugh on a, on a hard Monday morning, the system chokes every so often to try to figure out how to do this AI work, how to figure out my next best step. Jump forward to 2002, we've got Roombas. Everyone here might know what a Roomba is, might see a Roomba, might own one, might have hacked one. Kudos to you if you're a fan of that. But Roombas just work. You buy them and they just work. 
So from an AI standpoint, we're, we're now in the era where it's starting to become commercial. We're starting to see this, right? People have vir virtual assistants on their phone, whether it's Siri, whether it's Google Assistant. We've got home automation, courtesy of voice-activated assistants like Alexa, like um, Google Home. And then we have larger systems that look at sort of enterprise problems like IBM Watson and other larger systems. So we've seen AI start to become commercially viable, right? And, and this is a great moment if you're a technologist because you now start to play with these things. But the reality is, even though we're at the era where this stuff is becoming commercially relevant, we're not quite at a point where we fully mastered it. We're still learning a lot, and this stuff is still transitioning rapidly. That's why I think we're at a prime moment to start figuring out how do we do this better. I mean, we have to change rapidly to keep up with this technology as it shifts. And, and I think that's a good place for us to start our conversation. So who here remembers their first program, the first program they ever wrote? If you're not a technologist, think of the first large work deliverable, right? You can probably look back to that first moment, and it's transformative for you. That was a moment that defined your world at that time. And I remember mine very vividly. Mine was C++, written in Virtual Studio as a freshman in college. And I'd never coded before. Never. And that defined my world. That was very simply, you know, you have code that you write, it does things, you've got header files, and you've got line order. Life is good. Life is predictable. What a great framework. So much order, right? What could go wrong? I know exactly how these user interactions are going to go, and it's going to be great. It wasn't until my first internship, actually, at, at IBM, <clears throat> where I had the opportunity to write web code. It was a very simple exercise. Write that. Write a system that does that. This, this guy was going easy on me. But I remember in doing this the exercise, my mind was blown for the first of many times. I realized just how different technology is from what I thought. Just the change from simple you know, uh, C++ program to a basic JavaScript you know, front end. But it was so different because there's a new set of expectations, a new set of assumptions, a new set of understanding. So my mind was blown. And I thought, OK, I'm here. I'm good. Later, I got into async, asynchronous programming. And I started to realize all of the complexity that, again, I was completely ignorant of. As I've learned and gone through these different paradigm shifts, as we all have, it's, it's like your world gets expanded, right? You understand things that prior seemed out of your reach. For me, the most recent shift has been applied AI. And for me, that's been working with some APIs that IBM provides. And many other vendors have similar capabilities. So what does this mean for us, right? Well, paradigm shifts, this is common to us as technologists. We go through this on a personal level. We go through it as a professional level. Non-technologists, innovators, and entrepreneurs, they know this too. They follow markets. And as the market transforms, they transform with it or get disruptive. Outside of, uh, outside of roles, though, that, that force you to deal with these paradigm shifts, others might not know, might not have this experience. They might focus on a domain that maybe doesn't change and maybe doesn't get disrupted as much. This gives those of us who deal with disruption often sort of a, a leg up. We, we've seen this before, and we know how to handle some of these drastic shifts. And I see AI as the latest of these drastic shifts. So AI today. This is my what is AI slide. Like I said, high level. If anyone wants to talk later about it, happy. I'll be here, I'll be here the entire conference. But I look at AI, two, two big, uh, I see them in two categories. For this discussion, two categories. First category, general purpose. I think of this as build your own everything. You've got a rich set of frameworks that exist. They provide a lot of standard tooling and approaches that you can use to construct AI models. To do this, though, you really need to understand the way AI models are constructed. There are folks who do this, and they're experts, strong math backgrounds, strong statistics, analytics backgrounds. This is a great career for anyone who wants to get into it. But if you don't have those skills, oftentimes you get someone on the team who does. But the general advantage of these systems is you can tailor everything about the model. Every button, every knob, it's in your control. So you can model anything you want, provided that you have the time and the resources and the willpower to do so. The other type of AI models that I, the, of AI systems that we often see are specialized AI. I think of this as uh, pre-baked general purpose AI implemented for a particular set of use cases. Specialized AI are more likely what we see in business applications where a business wants to do something with AI, but they don't have the skills in-house or the interest in building something custom from the ground up. 
in a lot of projects where businesses are picking up AI, this is what we see. Because they have a set of use cases, they work with a vendor or consultancy that says, well, we know your problem, we've characterized it, it's either text classification, computer vision, et cetera. We know these vendors, we understand their implementations, so we bring your data here, use their implementation, maybe make some customizations based on some of the knobs that, that are available to us, and then we go off and run. Now there's a beauty in specialized AI. One of the most amazing things that I get very excited about, because there's, they're for known use cases, and because in the world of AI we understand it's not just developers who are touching this, many of these tools are even business user friendly. And you've got editors that abstract away a lot of the complexity. It's still complex to a degree. I'm not gonna, not gonna paint uh, vanilla icing on that, but it's easier than it's ever been. So to do something like shaky is surprisingly simple if you've got the hardware background for it. So what does this mean for us between general purpose AI, model whatever you want, provided you've got the time and skills, and specialized AI where you've got a lot of nice um, built for use case API application services to integrate that are so easy non-technical folks can get involved. Well, the dynamics are changing. AI projects are requiring us to bring new skill sets onto the team because first, you need someone who understands the AI system well enough to care and feed it well enough to load it up, even with a specialized AI. They need to be able to understand how to get your data to the right format that is conducive to the system learning. Folks who do data science in the room, this isn't new to you. But what we also see, courtesy of commercial AI that's business friendly, is the addition of domain experts. These are the folks who know their domain better than anyone else. These are the folks that could try to describe to you the nuance of what your AI model is supposed to do, and even if you were an AI expert, you might not grasp it. That's why so many vendors put up business-friendly, you know, user-friendly um, AI model creators. So these folks are bringing new team dynamics, because unlike the traditional software development teams that we're used to, these folks bring a very different perspective. In most AI projects that I'm on, for instance, we never have one domain expert. That won't do. You always have at least two. You may have as many as five. You may have as many as, really, 40 is the largest team I've seen. And these groups of folks bring with them a different set of expectations about how they work. For many of us here in the, in the DevOps world, we're familiar with Agile. We're familiar with quick ways to have dialogues, right? Ways to quantify the risk associated with a task and figure out where in the backlog is it, right? What's our stand-ups? 15 minutes, right? We get it all done so everyone gets to go do real work. But for some of these domain experts, they work the exact inverse. Because part of what makes them an expert is the ability to go down to the T of a sentence and determine, is this sentence about happiness or glee? And for those of us in the room who aren't experts on emotion, that's not a big deal. You said, it doesn't matter. It does matter. And that's why you have domain experts, because they help work with your AI systems to understand what is happiness versus what is glee. And in the context of your application, how should we treat it? And these conversations sometimes can, can become very passionate, can become very philosophical, and they're important. These conversations drive how we think about the problem, and sometimes they even drive what we're building. Now, this new dynamic requires us to think about new ways to be inclusive to these folks who come from different working cultures. Because the alternative of having these people in with us is that, and, and having them working as equal members is that we become uh, responsible for their feedback. And let me, let me just ask, how many folks here have ever been responsible for managing uh, customer feedback backlogs? People provide product feedback and you have to groom through it and respond to all of it and prioritize all of it. Show of hands, anyone who does that? Right. And I, I won't ask you if it's fun or not, I'll just say we know it's important. But if there was only a way to enable them to give you everything you needed to get it done, wouldn't it be great, right? The closer they could come to giving you, here's what I think it should look like, here's a prototype, pull request, take it or leave it, right? Sounds familiar, right? Some kind of software does that. I don't know what we call it. So here's where things get interesting, right? AI brings some interesting challenges. First off, behavior can only be indirectly influenced. This is key. Back in our paradigm shift, our first programs, right? We learned this in every shift, right? We, lose our assumptions that we clutch to, that we held dear, right? We figured that, you know, code that compiles runs well, we hope. 
but you run into JavaScript, and well, you don't compile it. It's just run. You just run it. Good luck. <laughs> and you know, you get used to that, or you cling on to a compiler. No, no judgment on either approach. But we find ways to accommodate that. In the world of AI, you don't program a system. You don't tell the system what to do. You teach it. Or you, you give it data and teach it, or you give it data and let it learn on its own. Both approaches work, but in either case, you don't really have direct control over what it's learning. My example is my parents', my parents dog. Her name is Lizzie. Great energy, great energy. My dad's retired, mother loves dogs, they have a lot of fun. They've tried their best to tell this dog not to jump on that chair. I've, I've been there, and, and I have a dog too, and I tried to praise the dog when it gets off the chair, tried to give the dog a treat to come down, you know, tried to scold it, tried to carry it off the chair, million things. We've tried everything that we can think of, that we can read anywhere about how to train this dog not to get on that chair. But this dog, whatever it's learning, it's not to not to get on that chair. And believe it or not, AI systems are similar. We can adjust and tweak knobs. We can change variables. But ultimately, we can't force the system to do anything. We can teach it to think and see what it's thinking and see if it's reasoning appropriately. Input data is unpredictable. Now, this is not net new to AI, right? You know, you can't trust your users, right? But in the world of AI, I, you don't know what you're getting. Because AI, especially some of the commercialized narrow AI frameworks that exist, some of these APIs you pull in, they rock at unstructured data. So you know your great text field and you've got that comments box with a couple lines of code, pull in an API that is AI powered, can read that freeform text box and tell you what they're happy or upset about. You have no control over what's in there. You get a bunch of emojis. You could get JavaScript code, right? I mean, you know, DevSecOps people, you're like, oh, you should catch that. But you could get anything. It's unstructured text. I mean, you know, human, human expression with computers, right? It's a difficult thing. But what does this mean for our AI models? Well, you can train a dog well. That's my dog. She's a good dog. She knows when we go on walks that she's not supposed to pick up sticks because the minute she picks up a stick, it's a stick delivery mission. Nothing else happens. <laughs> and, and if another dog comes and wants to play and interact, she gets really mean because sticks are a big deal. She knows now, no sticks. We've taught her, no sticks. We've, tr we've, we've treated her, we've trained her. She's stubborn. It's a breed thing, right? It's a complex model, but we got it. So when she sees sticks, she knows better. She doesn't pick them up. She's like, and we're good. But when she sees something that we didn't think about, I, don't, I won't say that I've ever come across a cinnamon stick on the floor. Safe for dogs, though. That's why I use the example. But if she came across this cinnamon, it, would, it might kind of resemble a stick. She might have maybe the visual. This is sort of a cylindrical thing. But it's not really a stick. It's a it's cinnamon, right? It doesn't taste like wood. It doesn't smell like wood. It doesn't smell like the other dogs who picked it up, unless there's other cinnamon-loving dogs. But it, it's, it's, it's completely different, and it's outside of everything we imagined. But when you're walking out on the street, you've got an AI system dealing with unstructured data. You don't know what you're going to get. And in this case, our dog, which I still hold as a good dog, won't recognize it as a stick, and it's going to pick it up and run with it. Now, for our purposes, well, that, that is a stick, right? I mean, I would define that as a stick under the class of don't pick that up when we're on a walk, because then nothing's going to happen. <laughs> but she doesn't know any better, right? My, my dog doesn't know any better. And, and your AI systems won't. And you really won't know what's coming until it comes. You won't know what you're going to get in user feedback reviews until you get it. This requires a shift of thinking. Because keep in mind, the folks who are working on some of these models might not have the expertise of all of this room, might not have dealt with awesomeness of critical security flaws and day one exp or day zero exploits, right? But they're creating systems that are going to deal with some of those same dynamics. Now, cattle versus pets. In the DevOps community, this, this metaphor exists for a while. We all mostly know it very well, right? It's the idea that your servers aren't special anymore. You just have application instances running wherever, and you kill them and raise them up as you need to. And that makes sense, right? Go us. We did it. But in the world of AI, things get interesting. Because these AI models that we build get a lot of investment, require a lot of investment to be successful. Even a commercial API for natural language processing where you just want to figure out what text is about, that requires investment, especially if you want to train the system to recognize themes that are important to your business, to your mission. So what happens? 
Well, you spend a lot of time in this model, you build it, business requirements change, you evolve it, you're proud of it, it becomes a pet. And honestly, it has to. For these things to succeed, they have to be care and fed to some degree. You need experts in, you need diversity of perspectives across those experts. But then what happens when you want something new or you learn something that changes the game? Well, that existing model, my dog again, she, how does it respond? My dog's good at a lot of things. She loves people, she loves high fives, she hates wearing clothes. If she was a dog that we trained out of the box to be a show dog, to strut around, to wear clothes early on, and that was all she did, my in-laws have former show dogs as pets, no problem. That guy loves this stuff. He loves hats, outfits, he loves it. I reserve my opinion on how I feel, though I like the sombrero on my dog. <laughs> but when I put it on, I, I, as you see in the photo, she gets this stare of, it, it, it's like the, the, the meme you might see of the dog doing the math in its head. She's trying to process what's happening. Because we don't put a lot of clothes on her, because we know she doesn't like it. And yet, if we did that early and that was what we did instead of, I don't know, potty training her, maybe it would be no problem. But organizations will have models that they'll want to extend, they'll want to grow, but as you grow your model, the underlying complexity becomes more and more dangerous. And then the question becomes, do you have a model that covers a wide use case, or do you have different models for different explicit use cases? There's pros and cons to both approaches. I won't tell you which is right or which is wrong, but that metaphor of cattle versus pets comes back again in the world of AI. And then finally, what are the risks here? I'm not here to spread fear, uncertainty, doubt, but a bad AI can do something as simple as categorize happy as glee, as say, um, Mr. instead of Mrs., as say something as can instead of can't. Small changes because of a flub, a quick flub. But that system could also, a bad AI, have even more extreme repercussions. A poorly trained AI system connected to business critical processes can make a decision that is dangerous and a huge liability for the business. There's a possibility that a bad AI system that is critical to, a, to, a, to an operation can, can even tank a business if we're not careful. So, so the stakes here have never been higher. And there's a need to understand how do we handle all of this complexity. And this is where I think DevOps can come in. So what if we did that? What if we took all this great insight we have, right? Because software is important too. Software similarly is in the way of the critical path for many of our businesses or our agencies. What if we took those lessons and put them towards these AI problems? Well, I think that adds a lot of value. I think there are ways to address many of the AI problems, ways to empower these new members of our AI team using the practices that we know are tried and tested. Things like continuous testing, integration, deployment. Figure out ways that whenever that model is changed, we validate some set of baseline. We do it in a way that's automated. We make that easy because retesting your AI model, important but non-creative work. Your domain experts, you're not paying them to come and test a model. You're paying them to help shape it and to analyze some of the results. If you're a development team involved in this, you don't want to be in this business. This is dangerous. It has a lot of implications. And you're not directly involved in the model creation. And when you get output from a model, it's not black, white, red, or blue. It's a set of answers, a set of ideas. And so it becomes a very contested topic to determine what's right and what's wrong. So it's important to get buy-in of what do we consider right or wrong, write that into a practice, a run book, an automation, and run with that. And if the team decides it changes, as we might in an agile world, we update that and document why. That way, the responsibility is to the team, and no, one, no single person is responsible. They're empowered to move quickly. You're empowered to support them and still do critical developer work, critical operations work. And the key thing here, I can't stress enough, collaboration. You have to, we have to enable these new members of our AI project teams to, to be equal participants. We have to bring them in to the, in the same way we've brought in security. We have to empower them early on to share their perspectives because it's going to empower and transform the way we think about our application. So let's look at something real, something that I'm currently involved in in, in, in my company, an internal project. A um, lot of ambiguity here, but I feel like the general, the general concept can come across. We're creating something very simple, an AI chatbot. I know chatbots aren't new, but this is an AI chatbot. So behind the scenes, we have text 
clustering, classification going on. So we have a lot of data that goes into a simple good morning. But if you want a system done right, that's the level you need it, even a simple chatbot application. And this chatbot I'm excited about is, is in the HR domain, and we're using it to help uh, people new to the company understand some of the technical career pathways. So you get to a big company like my three-letter one, and you want to say, well, what, what do I do? How do I get there? You know, it's big, and I don't know anyone outside of my team. And this system can walk you through it, it can familiarize you with some of the great processes and models we have to grow your career. And we've got a bunch of great domain experts. I was big on this. Get us people from HR. Get us people from the career model. Get us people here to represent how it should be done. And of course, they don't agree with each other. And, and of course, and, and I mean this sincerely, they are all right. All of their perspectives as experts are completely justified because they come from diverse backgrounds. And their sets of experiences and their assumptions and their perspectives, even when in conflict, are completely correct for the circumstances that they handle. One in Australia, one in North America, several others internationally, and they're all right because they have different populations of new employee at company with a different set of needs. So how do we resolve this? How do we approach this? Well, let's look at what data we feed in. Like I said, chatbot, right? Simple, right? We've all been hit up by a chatbot on Skype or somewhere. We figured out it was a bot, had some fun, maybe got some, if you did it right and you won the prize, got it to spit back JavaScript code at you and you got to see the regex, right? Not, not everyone's done this, right? You don't have to say if you did. Well, nowadays, chatbots tend to be a lot more complex, but again, still business user centric. First, a set of classifiers for our input, deciding what are the, the, the term IBM uses is intense, right? But what are the, the classes we use to figure out what a person's talking about? Then, a set of training data for each classifier. So five classifiers, think of like, at a minimum, five examples of what a user might say. In our case, we're dealing with an audience that includes people who might not have English as a, as a, as a primary language. So not only do we have native English speaker, we have non-native English speaker. We also have to worry about language localization, right? Already, you can see the data starting to grow. We have sets of object classifiers, where we look at, you know, think of them like nouns within your data. So we know, talking about this input, this um, intent, this entity. And again, set of training data for all of that, for each of those object classifiers. And then, your, finally, your logic, which keys on intents and entities, right? Your different classifications to determine what to do. With this, you can do anything in an AI with a chatbot. But this is a bunch of data sets. It gets updated often by people on opposite sides of the world at different time zones. I say, let's treat them as artifacts. Let's treat it as code. Let's do AI model as code. Let's do classifiers as code. Let's do training data as code. So whenever my business users make a change, whenever anyone makes a change, we push it to a Git repo. We, we push it to a staging area. We do versioning control. How do we test it? Well, I don't want my business users, my domain experts, and I don't want to sit there typing to this AI hundreds of lines of things. So we set up automated testing in our pipeline. We set up a series of what we think users would say, both people who we thought you know, had a clear mastery of English and people who might not have had fully correct you know, sentence structure, et cetera, as many cases as we want. And in this way, we're able to simulate as, as many as we want, really, user interactions and validate the baseline of when someone asks this question, the system interprets it correctly. And then finally, we looked at the culture shift. We brought in these experts early on in the process, but then we went out of our way to train them on the tooling, which I said, business user friendly. We showed them how, we explained it to them, and fortunately, they were as, as zealous as we are to get it right. They got hands on, they got certified, they got open badges about our, our AI chatbot system. They know the tooling. And so they're in it. And we wrap that around these DevOps practices, basic as they are now, to give them security that they could change things as often as they felt they needed to. This pulled myself and the development team out of that critical path and enables our small team of developers to empower a larger team of subject matter experts. Now, this is just one project in the approach we took to integrate these practices. Uh, I strongly believe that in many AI projects, your DevOps skills can come to bear. So I strongly encourage you, in that next AI project, jump in, raise your hand, and say, hi, how can I help? Thank you very much.